Greetings, everyone. I'm Jeremy Simon with 3D Universe, and welcome back to another episode of 3D Universe Untethered. This is an ongoing uh, series that we've been doing, currently happening bi-weekly, where we get to sit down with folks in uh, various industries where they're taking, making use of digital fabrication technologies, 3D printing, laser cutting, that sort of thing, and getting to hear about uh, what they're doing and uh, some stories about how they've been able to make use of these exciting technologies. And we've got a great show for you tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking with uh, Harrison Cricks from Bulp and Props, who I'll introduce momentarily and hearing about how they've been using uh, 3D printing and other digital fabrication technologies uh, to grow their business. Uh, I want to remind everyone, as always, that you can visit our blog at 3duniverse.org, and uh, there's always a graphic in the upper left there for 3D Universe Untethered. That'll take you to the page that has the full listing of episodes, the recordings from past episodes, and uh, the, the news and links you need about the ones that we have coming up. So please stay tuned and uh, join us. We've got a lot of exciting content coming up for you. With that, let me bring the others on screen here and do some introductions. Uh, some of you already know Jen Owen, who joins me uh, as my co-host here. She's our creative director here at 3D Universe. Welcome back, as always, Jen. Thank and you. And we also have Harrison Cricks, as I mentioned, from uh, Volp and Props. Glad you could join us today, Harrison. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. So Harrison is the owner and founder of Volp and Props, uh, having started that business from a hobby while doing graphic design work. Harrison started doing prop making as a Halloween activity. Some of his projects got a lot of attention on sites like mm -hmm. Dig and Reddit. Some people started asking him for side projects. Eventually, in about 2011, he quit his job to focus full time on Vulpin Props. And the company has since continued to evolve over the last decade from one prop maker in his garage making kit helmets to a full studio employing many talented artists specializing in prop replicas and esports awards for the video game industry. So, this is a really a perfect fit for our show here for 3D Universe Untethered because we love these stories of where somebody had some dream or some passion that they wanted to pursue. And perhaps because of some of these digital fabrication technologies, they were able to pursue that and grow it into something where, I don't know, it maybe they you could have done it without these technologies, but it probably certainly wouldn't have been as doable. So we, we love to hear these these types of stories. We think that's the, the, the empowering thing about these these technologies. So So glad you could be with us tonight, Harrison. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the idea of uh, creating something from a dream. Um, I will, I will say, when I got into this, when I got into prop making, I, I just wanted it to be a hobby. A lot of people told me, "Oh, you should do this at full time. This should be your full time job." And I always thought, I, I, I don't want to make my hobby my full time job because then you'll, then you'll go to, you know, you'll end up hating your hobby. You don't want to do it anymore. Um, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that didn't happen. Um, you know, I've been able to transform it into my full-time job, but I've, I've sort of been dragged kicking and screaming into this career. <laughs> I, I, it wasn't, uh, it, it, I, I never in, intended to have a large studio with a, with a bunch of employees or anything like that. Uh, I'm there now and I'm very grateful for it. Um, but uh, uh, you're, you're giving me a lot of credit uh, in, in insinuating that I had a plan. Um, and uh, <laughs> it, it's mostly been uh, extemporaneous from, from then to today. Mm-hmm. Can you give us a little bit of a background on like how you got started in prop making? I am personally a cosplay nerd. So, oh. um, and I just got a laser cutter and I just made my first 3D print. So I am looking forward to going from cardboard and uh, going through the junkyard and finding metal to fabricating my own stuff at some point. Well, yeah, cosplay was definitely sort of the the gateway drug, if you will, to my my prop making mm -hmm. career. Um, in uh, in two thousand seven, I want to say, uh, my girlfriend and I uh, decided we were going to go as Link and Midna from the Legends of Zelda: Twilight Princess for Halloween, and mm -hmm. uh, she did all the sewing, um, and I was like, I, you know, I'll do the hard stuff. I'll do the the you know the not hard as in difficult, but hard as in you know uh, prop replica kind of like hard-sided elements. Um, I'm a mechanic or, or was in a previous life. Um, and so I was like, build cars, I can work on motorcycles. Like, sure, I can build props. Uh, that is so wrong, um, but I tried it anyway. Um, and I ended up making a couple of pieces for us to do on Halloween, uh, you know, to wear around and made a link shield and Midnus headpiece. And, um, and a lot of people were like, you know, have you, have you ever gone to Dragon Con? And we're from Atlanta. You know, Dragon Con's the big convention here. It has been for, mm -hmm. for 25 years now. Um, and so people were like, oh, you should really go to Dragon Con. And the two of us were, were kind of like, I don't know. That's like, 
it's kind of it's kind of nerdy. Like I'm not sure if that's really a thing. And so uh, and then we went in 2008, and then after that we're like. Oh my God, Dragon Con! Like, with this is our Christmas, this is Christmas, yeah. New Year's, uh, both our birthdays. We take like we'll both of us. We'll work Christmas Eve. We'll work New Year's Eve. We'll work on our birthdays. We will take the week of Dragon Con off because it is <laughs> bad for us. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, cosplay was the kind of thing, and I, I did I did a, a handful of pieces for us for cosplay pieces, um, and then in two thousand eight, I made a portal gun um, from Valve's first portal game. And I threw it out online, and like the next day, uh, well, I'm sorry, rather, uh, my wife put a, a post up on StumbleUpon and on Dig, uh, you know, that kind of dates when this was in, in 08. And um, uh, next morning, I had a bunch of emails, and, uh, you know, one of the emails was from the guys at Valve, and they were like, hey, we, you know, we love this portal, and this is amazing, can you make us one? And I had private collectors emailing me. I had uh, tech blogs from the time, you know, back before uh, you know, Gawker was a bigger thing. You know, people from Gizmodo and Engadget were like, oh, we'd really love to like talk about this and show it to some of our readers. Um, Hackaday was another uh, website that covered it. Mm -hmm. So like, I got, a lot of, I got a lot of attention, a lot of press, and I went, there's something to this, you know, um, but I'm not really that good right now. <laughs> I really need to, um, <laughs> I really need to practice more. I need to get better at this. And so for the, you know, for the three years after that, I took commissions as a way to sort of self-educate. You know, I, I, I had some very patient, very tolerant clients uh, that have very, very low budgets, but very extended deadlines. And so they came up and they're like, hey, I want a Daft Punk helmet or I want this rifle from uh, from Fallout or, or some other uh, piece. A lot of times for cosplay, sometimes for personal collection. And um, they would come to me and I, I would work my day job, which was a, as a graphic designer, uh, go to work at eight, come home at six, eat dinner. And I go out in the garage and I work until, you know, midnight or one in the morning on these projects. And I would mess up over and over again. I'd screw up everything and get everything wrong um, and learn and teach, uh, teach myself and learn, learn, learn and research. And so, uh, you know, after three years of that, I felt confident enough to, to actually start this as a full-time profession. That was in 2011. So th that's the, the shortest way that I can summarize the first five <laughs> years of my career. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, have you always been a maker? Were you like one of those kids that was like stealing all the popsicle sticks and all the pipe cleaners and stuff like that from the, the, the drawer or, or what? Uh, definitely. Uh, my, I grew up in a, in a, in a household uh, that never bought anything new. You know, we always bought old, broken stuff and fixed it. Um, mm -hmm. My grandfather was a machinist. My dad was a, in sales, but, you know, he built cars. He taught me how to build cars and, and work on, uh, you know, all sorts of different machinery. Um, <clears throat> I remember one time I was in, like, fourth grade, and uh, my dad pulled up uh, to pick us up after school, and he was driving a 24-foot U-Haul trailer mm -hmm. um, because he had been browsing through the newspaper, and he found a two-story uh, wrought iron spiral staircase for free. Um, <laughs> and it was just rusty out in some property, and he, he got this U-Haul, and he dragged it home, and then he proceeded to build a two-story deck around that as, <laughs> as sort of the focal point. And so, you know, growing up, I got a little taste of everything. I got, you know, home electrical work, uh, you know, low-voltage DC 12-volt kind of stuff. Um, drywall plumbing masonry all that all that stuff and then in the interim i was always uh, breaking things or taking things apart um you know i think one thanksgiving i took a giant magnet plunked it dead center in my uh, my uncle's brand new television uh because I, i'd seen something in like a you know uh, like a like a newsletter, like a little like website thing at the time. It was like, oh, you know, old black and white TV. You can move the magnet around and, and mess with the tube. And I was like, oh, cool. I screwed up my my uncle's like twelve hundred dollars TV. So that was me back back in the day. Uh, not not always successful, but you know, learning things. That's how we yeah. learn. That's awesome. Um, I think you already kind of went over what you've made for your first cosplay prop design. Um, did you ever make anything as a kid with props? Oh, yeah, I, uh, uh, you know, a couple of times. Um, I, <laughs> I got in trouble a lot when I was in school for not paying attention. 
um, <laughs> in class, uh, and I would I would sneak toys in. I would sneak little micro machine cars or Hot Wheels cars or stuff, and I'd just play with them at my desk instead of paying attention to class. And um, at one point in time, uh, my my parents used to like like pat me down before I went to school to make sure I wasn't like hard the micro machine like my, my my shoe or something, which I did do. Uh, and so at one point in time, I, I I stole a roll of masking tape. I think it was in first grade, and um, Instead of paying attention in class, I, I would take the masking tape and I would roll it like I'd, I'd stretch it out and I'd, I'd roll it into tubes and I'd flatten it and I made a biplane out of it by like by like you know <laughs> folding it into a wing and then making it into a fuselage and, and whatever you're picturing, it's way crappier than that. Um, you know, <laughs> this is a third grader attempt, so it's you know a, a, a biplane in name only in the sense that it had a tube with with two you know wing type items. Um, you know, but it was it was identifiable, I suppose, uh, enough for my teacher to catch me doing it, to call my parents, to have a parent teacher conference. Um, and uh, and uh, my parents are sitting across my teacher and uh, my teacher's like, he's not paying attention to class. And my mom's like, okay, he's, he's and at, at the time, he's getting straight A's. She's like, so he's, he's doing fine. And, she, and she's like, yeah, he's not paying attention. She's like, but he's he's ace in the class, so I don't see why we're here. And um, the teacher bring out the, brought out this little airplane. She's like, "This is what he's doing." Instead of paying attention to <laughs> or whatever they're trying to teach me at the time, uh, and my dad was like, "Oh, that's so cool!" And he kept it. Like <laughs> he got it. Today. He thought it was the neatest right thing. Good um, so you know, I was I was encouraged for sure. Uh, you know, not not to blow off all of my responsibilities, but my parents <laughs> definitely definitely helped in that, which was mm -hmm. great. Um, you know, so I, I made that. I like. I remember for like a school play in seventh grade, I had to make like, I had made for some reason. I, I don't believe this was any part of the play, but uh, I, I got it into my head that what it really needed was a grenade launcher. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I have no recollection of the play or what took place or why it. Why it in, in my mind really needed that grenade launcher, but I made the hell out of that grenade launcher with some cardboard <laughs> tube. Yeah, made it happen. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so we get to geek out a little bit now. Let's talk about 3D printing. When did you first get involved with 3D printing and when did you start to incorporate that into your process? So my first experience with 3D printing was not on the on the, the builder side. I did not have a printer. Um, I, I had no experience in 3D modeling. I've never used a slicer. You know, I'd never manipulated models in a workspace. Uh, I went to school for graphic design, actually. I was, okay. a, uh, I was a PowerPoint designer. So you came seven. from a 2D world. Yes, a uh, very, God, a very 2D world, like graphs and charts and like the driest possible uh, uh, example <laughs> of 2D design. Okay. You could even phrase it that way. Um, but uh, so I, I had, you know, I'd open 3D files before. I, I remember, of, you know, a couple of guys used to work with us, and uh, when I worked in in graphic design, and they'd give us like stage set renderings that I'd modify in Photoshop. But I had no experience with that, and so everything I did was by hand from 2007 until probably 2014. Um, you know, I, I my, like I said, my grandfather was a machinist. I'd grown up around lathes and mills, drill press, bandsaw, table saw, all that kind of stuff. So I can I can build with my hands very quickly. As a matter of fact, side note, um, at, right after I got my first Ultimaker, um, uh, I want to say three months after, I raced it to build a pistol. Um, I, <laughs> I had a live stream, a 24 hour long live stream in which I scratch built the same item that the printer was printing. And I, I raced it over the course of a day to see if I could, if I could match it. Um, it was, it was really anything. We did a, a charity drive, uh, for yeah. doctors up orders, um, raised a, raised a bunch of money for that. It's pretty cool. Well, how, and I how'd did it go, how'd it go? Uh, at the end, I would say my dimensional fidelity was fine. Uh, I would say that both of them required the same amount of post processing in order to make okay. it, um, you know, to 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 make it a, a viable finished prop. I will say I probably sandbagged the printer a little bit by by you know getting like four walls and twenty five percent infill. So like I gave myself a little extra time, um, but you know. I, I love scratch building. If I could, I'd scratch build everything. That's not viable. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, 
you know, it was, it was a fun, it was a fun race. Um, yeah. I, by great. the end of it, what it taught me was I need sleep. Uh, and, <laughs> and that was, that was what I needed to do. So anyway, uh, to your point, to your question, my first experience with 3D printing was outsourcing some of, some of the printing for my props to a local uh, group of guys that had a, a couple of really rough maker bots, like, like, really bad uh, that were that were in in a in a bad way you know uh huge nozzles giant layer height layer separation acetone smoothing i mean all the all the things that turn people off of this kind of technology and it did to me um after i after i uh, kind of dipped my toe in that i was like 3d printing man this sucks i just <laughs> waste their time i have to rebuild all this from scratch anyway this is ridiculous um, and a, a friend of mine, uh, who's a phenomenal sculptor, his name is Travis Wood. Um, and we, we contract a lot of our 3D modeling out to him these days. Um, Travis convinced me like, Hey, you know, that was an isolated incident. You should really get your own machine. You should really, you know, figure out what this is. And so in 2015, I think I got my first Ultimaker two plus extended. Um, and it, like you, like you mentioned earlier, Jim, with your laser cutter, um, with with a piece of technology like that for me if i have it in front of me i'll learn everything about it you know i gotta right. uh, that's how i learned how to use a laser cutter is i i won one in a contest and then i'm like well i have to know literally everything about this and then i i, I do i drilled into it and I, I learned all i could and that's what it was for the ultimaker with me as soon as i got that and i understood you know went through the slicer went through cure i learned mesh mixer taught myself fusion 360 i was like okay now i know why those things that I got before were so deficient, why they needed so much maintenance and so much work. The print orientation was wrong. Imagine printing a pistol, you know, uh, 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 horizontally so that all the layer heights just stack up along the Z axis. Um, you know, they were printing screw heads, they were printing a static trigger, like all of these like things that props you just don't, you just don't do. Um, and, and that's what it came down to was planning and forethought and, uh, and, and, understanding the technology and manipulating it to get the better result. So yeah, my first experience was bad. I'll be honest, like it turned yeah. me off a while. But then once I got my own machine, I went, oh, okay. Now, yeah. if I can control this, I can control the variables. I can make it do what I need. There you go, mm -hmm. yeah. So now that's become a big part of your business. Let's talk about what, what kind of tools do you have in the shop now uh, in <laughs> terms of digital fabrication, 3D printers, laser cutters, things like that. What sort of stuff do you have that you're working with now? Yeah, we, we you know in 2015 we had the one Ultimaker, um, the two plus extended, and I had a uh, full spectrum laser. Um, uh, I think it was a nine by 12 40 watt machine, mm -hmm. um, and so that was six years ago. Uh, currently, we have eight Ultimaker two plus extendeds, <laughs> one nice. Raise 3D Pro two plus. Okay. Uh, we have two Form threes. Uh, I have an Elegoo Saturn and an Elegoo Mars. And then I have a Boss Laser LS2436, which is a two foot by three foot, 150 watt uh, CO2 <laughs> laser. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> you talk about, you talk about that. man, this thing can cut through one inch of foam. So if you want to make some cool armor props, whatever, if you've got a digital pattern for it, put the whole thing in there, cut out the whole thing in Ava, start gluing it together. It is so nice. That is a lot of fun. <laughs> so let's talk about the 3D printers just for a bit first. So the on the you, you've got a number of, of different 3D printers, and I assume they serve different purposes. What do you tend to use each of those different kind of groups of printers for? Like what do you use the Ultimakers versus those SLA printers, you know, that sort of thing? So our our Mars machines, uh, if you'll if you'll forgive this for being a little snotty, I think might be the way to say they're kind of disposable. Like we run, especially the, you know, the Elegant Mars is a $230 resin machine. And so we'll just throw stuff at that because it's cheap to run. The resin's cheap. Repairs are cheap. If we need to test something and we don't want to put the, put the mileage on our forms, we'll just chuck it on that and see dimensionally how it works. If it's, if it's okay. We don't ever really run any end use stuff on our Elegant machines. They're, they're perfectly competent machines. Great for costuming great for home use and, and you know, they're, they're really nice. Like the, the fidelity that they offer is phenomenal. The dimensional accuracy isn't there with, with those LCDs yet. So we just run them on tests. We have them there because they're, they're dirt cheap compared to the rest of our machines. Mm -hmm. Our forms, we do mostly figuring work. Um, 
and uh, we'll do like uh, we do a lot of esports medals. You know, really comp complex like Olympic medal kind of things. Lots of tags, lots mm -hmm. of raised and blocked elements, that kind of thing. We'll run them on that because we're we're after like you know super fine fidelity on that. So uh, the forms mainly, you know, their build volume is pretty small. So we don't push those that hard. Um, a lot of times what we'll end up doing is FDMing a, a, a large segment of a piece, say like a trophy cup, and then we'll SLA some accessory pieces to kind of stick onto it when we're in the mold making casting process so that we don't have to try and like clean up all these little print lines or anything. We can, we can do the larger amount of the body work on uh, a machine like an Ultimaker, which again costs way less to run than a form. And it's way faster to clean up. The machine prints faster at that sort of scale. And then we'll accessorize it with the smaller prints. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the ultimakers are absolutely our workhorses. We have, uh, I was telling uh, you guys about this uh, on, the, on the, you know, the tech call earlier. One of our machines is 12,000 hours on it. And that was the, the machine from 2015. Oh, yeah. That thing is, he's been to hell and back. Um, and uh, yeah. still doing it. I mean, the thing is, a uh, thing is a monster. And for for whatever reason, that first one I got, which was a rebuild, I bought I bought new ones that have needed more maintenance uh, <laughs> sooner than my current, or you know, than my ancient one for you know whatever reason. Um, you know, so the Ultimaker, we, we call it our array, and you know, we've got all eight of them lined up, and it's great because if we get files for something we can set them all up on the machine at, at seven o'clock before we go home or before we go home for the day and we'll wake up, come to shop the next morning, they're all ready to go. Uh, they're, those mm -hmm. machines are nice and quick. Um, they're the older, I mean, obviously they're older, two plus extended is a, is a, a six year old model, seven year old model mm -hmm. at this point in time, but they're just dead reliable. And that to us is the, the watermark. It has to be consistent. Um, you know, the forms can get finicky. Uh, they can kind of, they can get, you know, some weird glitch in the software. Their firmware can be a little, a little hiccup here and there, or sometimes a print will stick to the bed or something. Um, the Mars or the Elegant machines are real finicky, man. Those things will, they'll throw a fit <laughs> for anything. Um, and then the Rays is, the Rays is a, a phenomenal machine. It's a, it's a monster. The thing's two feet tall and, you know, it's yeah. got 12 by 12, uh, uh, X, Y. Um, we don't tend to run it as frequently because we just don't need it. You know, it. Uh, I'd say that gets about a quarter of the runtime as our ultimakers. It, you know, when you need it, it's the only thing that can do the job. But exactly. the rest of the time, it's just this sort of silent tower over in the corner of the shop. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so cool. that's really cool. I remember the first time I saw the raised uh, 3D printer at Jeremy's when I had to go over to Chicago. Um, it reminded me of walking into like the, uh, you know, the tire shop where you go and you get the free popcorn. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you, I know you said you use laser cutters. Um, what kind of things do you use it for? Is it like bare, is it like, um, bare bones to, to work around or, or how do you use the laser cutters in your work? Uh, it has made us catastrophically lazy. Uh, if, we, <laughs> if we need to cut a circle out of a piece of paper, we will go over to the to the laser cutter and we'll put that piece of paper in the laser and we'll cut that circle out of it. It's <laughs> once you get one of those, especially if you just have it accessible all the time, anything that can fit in there goes in there. Uh, and so, like. <laughs> Uh, I, I would like to I would like to uh, wow you with the many phenomenal pieces, uh, that have come out of there. but I mean, it is it is a a it is not a glorious position that machine holds. Um, we do a lot of when we do an esports trophy. We'll make a felt base for it, you know, for the bottom of the trophy, and we'll like engrave the name of the esport or the the logo of the the company or the particular uh, venue or whatever it is into the bottom of do that on laser. Um, we'll, we'll laser cut stencils, and masks, we'll laser cut uh, display stands. We do a lot of packaging in there because it can it can laser mm -hmm. cut Avafone. Uh, I just shipped out these um, these katanas uh, to a company called CD Project Red and the replicas from a game uh, called Cyberpunk uh, 2077. Yeah. And uh, they have these, you know, these big, you know, Ava foam inserts that are half inch thick that have a, a katana profile in them with a bunch of holes for zip ties. Throw them in laser, run it in there, works great. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so 
we do plaques uh, for esports trophies. We do shipping labels. Uh, you know, to to we'll etch it into the crate such that it doesn't like fall off during shipping. Um, mm -hmm. We'll cut. You know glass uh, my my uh, dining room has a lovely hutch in it uh that's a china cabinet where i etched a pattern into the glass on it you know it's just you know anything that will not imminently catch fire uh <laughs> and sometimes the, the stuff that catches fire too we made a, a replica i'm not sure if you guys have ever seen the um the arby's social media account they do a lot of weird neat mm -hmm. stuff with paper craft and cardboard um, it's a lot, you know, they do a lot of geek culture kind of things and they'll take the, the Arby's packaging and they'll make a reference to Final Fantasy VII or, you know, uh, Howl's Moving Castle or any, you know, and they'll re recreate these really amazing sculptures out of, out of fast food packaging. And uh, for a convention in 2018, we made a seven and a half foot tall replica of a character called Nightmare from the game Soul Calibur, completely out of Arby's boxes. Um, and uh, the whole thing, just the whole thing is laser cut, just all laser cut, throwing Arby's boxes into that machine, cutting templates, gluing them together. Um, so yeah, that we, we definitely put it through its paces that I think we killed the tube on at that time. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And just for those of you watching, if you want to see some of these amazing projects that we're talking about, head over to vulpinprops.com, V-O-L-P-I-N props.com check out their work there and uh and mm -hmm. and you'll you'll see what we're talking about it's just some some amazing things are, are there are there some particular projects that you've done or pieces that you've done that have been your favorites or especially uh rewarding for you i've got personal pieces that that i uh you know that'll always be uh, important to me special to me um and then I've, I've got kind of like you know, personal artistic achievement and then like professional corporate achievement. And, you know, uh, sometimes there's, there's really amazing things that, that, that set my company up uh, for larger mm -hmm. projects in the future and, you know, provide a, you know, a, 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 what's the word I'm thinking of here? Um, profit share bonus to my employees. So like, that's phenomenal. You know, I, I love that kind of stuff. And then I have mm -hmm. things where I can be, you know, the, very artsy fartsy about it you know i, I get to i get to uh do the, the project i did uh, in 2018 that involved book binding and resin turning on a lathe and like like four days of painting with a with the like through a magnifying hoop with a size double lot like paintbrush and like just just really drilling down and being super artsy about it or i i created this uh, this replica of a, this tome from a game called uh pyre uh, and I, you know, that was fantastic. There was another piece we did uh, around Christmas time in 2019, a replica of a dragon from Elder Scrolls Online. His name is Cal Grantid. And um, that, there was like a whole bunch of clay sculpting and I got, I got to really drill into it. Um, I cheated a bit on that one though, because we had a really phenomenal, super high def 3D model from the game that the, the company Bethesda gave us to use. And we could have just run the whole thing in resin if we wanted to, but I, I wanted to clay sculpt it. So we took it into ZBrush and we deflated it by three millimeters and sort of smoothed it out. So it was this weird, like, weird sort of like uh, desiccated <laughs> jerky dragon. It was really weird looking. We printed it all out FDM uh, as a shell, as an armature, so that I, I didn't have to deal with proportion or scaling, I just had to deal with texture. And then we glued the whole thing together in this like three and a half foot wide, you know, a hollow uh, PLA armature. And then I proceeded to do all the clay work on top of it. Um, and that, that to me got, uh, let me do all the fun side of things. Uh, I got to do all like the, you know, texture and really neat detail and, you know, carving kind of stuff. And I didn't have to worry about all the boring stuff, which is like setting up your wire armature and setting up your, you know, your clay and, you know, baseboard and all that. And I got to jump straight to the good stuff. So, um, yeah, that's a, a good corollary there. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, obviously a lot of work goes into these things. I mean, I'm sure you, you've, you and your team must put so many hours into some of these, these projects. Is it, is it ever hard to give them away to the customer when you're done with them? Oh no, no. Once you spend this much time with something, you hate it. <laughs> um, I, there are pieces I look back on and wish I had a copy of. And and as a you know any prop maker, anybody who does what I do and has done it for a while, they'll tell you that they're like, ah, 
I kept the molds. I can pull my own kit. I can finish my own kit someday. You're never going to do that. Let's, yeah. you know, it's just in the attic of my studio. There's, uh, I have an entire shelf, like a, a six foot wide shelf that is filled with kits of mine. Uh, from some from other builders, some that that I've kept of my own work over the years, and I'm like, ah, yeah, one day, one day I'm gonna I'm gonna pull that down. I'm gonna finish that needler, that Planet Express ship, uh, that Mass Effect Mako, that shield, that sword, that you know, whatever. And they are all up there because as soon as I get, uh, you know, the drive, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna start something new. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it's a curse. Um, yeah. You know, I I. I I lament their absence, but you know, for me, the creation has always been the more desirable part of the art, less the ownership. So I'm glad they're appreciated somewhere. You know, um, that's all I can ever really hope for. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, you have talked about doing work for esports, but. Um, some of us have no idea what that means. Could you explain what esports are? Um, how, how, you know, it's interesting. I've never really been asked to define this. Um, so it's just it, it is it is as uh, as valid as any other competitive venue in which people attempt to score more points than someone else, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And the only difference is uh, the competitors in this sense are being tried and tested on their reaction times, their strategy, their planning and their teamwork, uh, and mm -hmm. less so about their physical prowess, uh, which isn't to say that, you know, conventional sports don't have, um, you know, their own teamwork and strategy and reaction times to there. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, companies have uh, have figured out that, you know, competitive gaming has always been a thing. I remember back mm -hmm. when I was in college, we had, uh, we used to have Halo tournaments at local bars. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the companies that run this sort of thing have figured out it's a good way to promote their titles. Um, and that the people at the upper, at the upper level of this provide some very entertaining, um, uh, gameplay to observe. Um, and so that, you know, for our end, we've been part of esports since 2015. Uh, Riot Games was our first uh, client in that arena. Um, and Riot was, you know, they were only a few years old at that point in time themselves. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have these, these games selling out enormous stadiums. Um, you know, people are, uh, the League of Legends World Championship uh, is frequently played in front of 15,000 people live and then online, uh, you know, a, a, a order of magnitude above that. Um, and, you know, with that comes sponsorships, with that comes um, branding, merchandising, and but also it comes with a big cool trophy for, uh, mm -hmm. for all to hoist and pick up. Um, you know, the NHL has their Stanley Cup um, and mm -hmm. NFL had the Vince Lombardi. And so we make all of the iconic ones for, well, not all, we make a lot, but we're not, we're not completely cornered the market just yet. Uh, we make all the trophies, um, you know, that we can with my team uh, for companies like uh, Psionics with Rocket League and uh, Riot Games League of Legends. We did a lot for uh, PUBG, um, gosh, uh, it's hard for me to list these off without looking at my own website because we do. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Has there been any that have been your favorite to make um, out of all of them? What is your favorite? My favorite esports trophy. Mm -hmm. You got a, a lot of awesome designs. Curious. You you me, I am going to pull up my own website here. For just Because <laughs> no. like I said, I've been doing this for. Um, for five, six years now, actually. Um, and so mm -hmm. over the course of that time, we've put together uh, dozens and dozens of these for, for various companies. Uh, my website is unfortunately very out of date right now, which I'm just now realizing. Uh, we just migrated over to a new site, so I think like 15 projects. Um, mm -hmm. let's say if you go to the website right now, there's a, a piece uh, that we made for a company called, oh, well, actually it was, um, Oh, man, I forget the name of that company. They are a very large parent organization. 
doesn't matter. The name of the game is uh, Arena of Valor, and it's this huge 24 karat gold plated, uh, very spiky, very um, sort of gravity defying elements to it. Uh, it was an incredibly technical piece um, that started off almost entirely FDM prints that were molded, cast, sanded, fit together, drilled for, for assembly, sent out for rhodium plating and then gold plating. Um, I've always really loved that one. I just, it's, it's got a, a really sort of super villain helmet vibe. <laughs> yeah. I find kind of sinister and fun. That sounds cool. What, so what's the process like when one of these companies approaches you and says, we want you to do a trophy for us. Um, what do they, what kind of direction do they give you? How much creative license do you have? What's that process like? It, it varies pretty significantly from, from company to company. Some, some people will come to us fully, you know, realized design. They'll, they'll have a 2d mock-up. They'll have a 3d model. They'll have a material spec, you know, they'll have a full, you know, almost brand standards guide. They'll drop to us and say like, here's what we need. Here's when we need it. Here's how to do it. Go. Um, and if I'm honest, I prefer not to have it that way uh, because a lot of times people don't really understand how these go together. And honestly, mm -hmm. why would you if you hadn't built one yourself? It's, it's you know, it's a, a lot of assumptions. Um, so we know a lot about putting these together, making them very, very physically strong while being visually delicate. And one of the things that you'll see in any sort of sporting celebration is whatever team, you know, wins the thing, they just, they pick it up and they're like, yeah, and they just shake the living bejesus out of it. Um, and uh, we, we have to make sure that at that, at that penultimate moment, um, you know, uh, it doesn't rattle apart and, and fall on somebody. Um, so, you know, some companies come to us completely ready to go and some companies will email us and they'll say, we need a trophy. We have three weeks and we have no idea what's, ha what's going on here. Um, <laughs> and so we'll, we can do 2D concepting, 3D modeling. We can, um, uh, you know, steer people through any decisions that need to be made. I will say one of the better things that came out of my experience in graphic design and working in marketing is being able to interface with clients and talk to them and kind of get an idea of what somebody who may not be the most artistically inclined person wants when they don't know quite how to express what it is thereafter. So I've gotten really good at steering people who know a lot about numbers um, into giving me artistic direction when they don't themselves really know what they're looking for. Um, right. So it's all across the map. You know, we, we've got to be fluid. We've got to we've got to be able to to pivot when people don't know what they want, and we've got to be able to gently steer people back when they give us uh, a suggestion that definitely won't work. Right. Yep. Um, I've been doing graphic design work for a long time, too. Um, I know exactly your pain. <laughs> um, can you uh, talk a little bit about the video game replicas? Like the, I was looking at the Poltergeist G00, um, mm -hmm. the process that you went through, the 3D printing, the laser cutting, the vacuum forming. Um, it looks like you had quite a large team for that. Um, how long did that take? And were, did you like split people up into teams so that they were each doing specific things or how did that work? Well, we had about two and a half weeks to make that, I believe, start to finish. Um, mm -hmm. Nintendo always releases a Luigi's Mansion game on Halloween. Um, you know, it's this big spooky kind of thing where you're, you're, you use the poltergust, poltergust to like suck up ghosts and, and control the environment. And so it's a, it's a major part of the game. Um, and, uh, I remember I was, I was out of town actually, when we got that project, I was uh, guesting at a convention uh, called TwitchCon and, um, with that project landed, I ended up, uh, 3d modeling the components for it in my hotel room and sending them back to the studio so that the guys working at the shop could start, you know, prototyping the stuff while I was out. Um, we had a crew of, well, my, actually, I believe it was just my full-time staff at that point in time. So there were only the four artists on that with, uh, with my one um, uh, business manager. 
And um, yeah, it was definitely an all hands on deck kind of thing. It's a very complicated piece. Uh, the, the whole red body of that, and if you go to my website uh, and go to the portfolio section, it's under the Poltergeist G00. We actually have a build video um, yeah. uh, on YouTube about how that whole thing went together. Um, yeah, the whole body of it was 3D printed out of FDM. It was done in, in a sort of shell almost. So it was, uh, it was only about three millimeters thick. And we did that so that, you know, we wouldn't have any weird infill or print lines or anything coming out after the fact. Um, after the shell was put together, I fiberglassed the interior to give it a little bit more added rigidity. And, and uh, the 3D printed shell on the exterior ended up being almost kind of a skin, if you will, um, mm -hmm. that, side, uh, that, that shell. Yeah, we we kind of did a little bit of everything on that. There's leather work in it. There's illumination. There's actually two fans built into the backpack. So when you press the button on the vacuum, um, it will uh, it will either if you press the the trigger button at the hand, uh, the push button, um, that will reverse the fans. And then when you pull the the handle, it either blows air or pulls air back in. So that I mean that was one of those things where I had to go back in my my mind and remember how to wire a uh, <laughs> pair of, of uh, five pole relays to a reverse polarity with a with a uh, toggle switch. <laughs> so yeah. good to have experience there. Um, that was a that was a rough one. I will admit those were a long two weeks on that project. <laughs> So your, your business has been growing quite a lot. You know, as we talked about you started this off just yourself uh, doing projects, and now you've got the team, not only the full-time folks, but a, a bunch of contractors that you use. Uh, how, has, how has the business grown over the years? How much has that been you taking steps to actively, you know, work on growing the business? And how much of it is just a function of people seeing your work and just kind of coming to you and, and getting more and more demand that way? Well, you know, one leads to the other, I, I guess. Um, we get requests for projects and I, I hate turning down work, but I do have to understand when something is kind of out of our wheelhouse when we don't have the ability to take it on. Um, it, I am very fortunate that we have a large group of freelance artists that I can call on when our own full-time staff isn't enough uh, manpower to, to tackle something. Um, you know, this kind of goes back to when I, I first got the attention about the portal gun back in 08, 09. Uh, one of the things I thought was, um, you know, hey, this is getting really big on, on stumble upon and dig and people are, I set up a, you know, blog spot page and I was like, nobody's going to remember me in like a week, you know, uh, it, it's, <laughs> it, 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 and gosh, the fact that the internet's attention in, in 2008 was a week long is insanity that you won't get a week anymore. Um, so nobody's going to think of me in a week. Um, so I need to build something else really quick. And I did. I, I put together a, uh, a bio, like a, a syringe from the game Bioshock. And uh, I did the same thing as I did with the portal gun, put, put a bunch of pictures out there, wrote up a, a blog article and, you know, and I kind of made it, made it like, Hey, this guy's going to keep doing this stuff. Maybe he'll keep updating every month. And so um, I've always kind of got that in the back of my mind. You know, um, I make it a point to travel out to conventions like E3 uh, and talk to gaming companies and pitch our work. Um, I make it a point to reach out to previous clients and to talk to people in industry about stuff that's coming up, about potential, uh, you know, uh, work for us in the future. We maintain a lot of, a lot of, you know, an active relationship with a lot of our better clients. Uh, well, a lot of our best clients, I guess, that, that want to have us back, especially for esports stuff. But we'll still knock on the doors of people we've only worked with once five years ago, and you know, sometimes they don't answer, but you got to keep doing it. Um, but yeah, we, we, you know, uh, that's that's any artistic journey, I guess, is is wanting to expand mm -hmm. and grow your skills. Uh, just like I taught myself fusion, and I, you know, I taught myself how to use these machines. It's, 3D printers and laser cutters, you know, I'm teaching the people who I employ how to do things like soldering, welding. Um, I teach them how to do HVLP painting. That expands our capabilities. We're able to take on more work. That expands uh, the work we get. Um, we're actually looking at um, knocking down the wall uh, into the space adjacent to us and expanding our workshop by another 2,400 square feet in the coming mm -hmm. month. So keep Sorry. snowballing. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Um, now that we're in the middle of a pandemic and all these conventions and stuff are canceled, um, have you seen a difference in your business or do you feel like um, because there's so many people at home now, 
um, doing maybe more esports that it's kind of balanced out, or is it? Do you, have you seen a drop or an increase, or or how is it working for you guys? So, um, I I would hate if we're in the middle of the pandemic. That means we've got another <laughs> um, before it's over. It'd be great if it wrapped up before that. Uh, yeah, I, I'll I'll admit, um, May like April, May, June. 2020 was some rough times. Uh, yeah. that, was, that was a bad handful of months for us. Um, <clears throat> most of our work is is very public. Um, esports typically takes place in large stadiums, large arenas. Even the smaller tournaments, they'll you know they'll sell out a theater for it or a, a smaller mm -hmm. uh, you know on campus arena like uh, you know Blizzard's Overwatch Championship. Um, and then, for instance, like Blizzard, who's one of our better, you know, our better year-to-year -year clients, um, uh, they they come back to us typically for at least one project annually. Uh, no BlizzCon last year, and uh, without a BlizzCon, there's no you know, Overwatch World Championship, which we do work for. There's no Hearthstone Championship, which we do work for. Um, there's no game announcements, which we've done work for in the past. So you know, that's potentially mm -hmm. tens of thousands of dollars that we've lost, um, and all of that came came crashing down uh, May, June, July. Uh, and that was, it It was it was panic inducing for real. Um, yeah. The benefits of that, uh, since esports is as big as it is, uh, mm -hmm. far larger companies than mine and far more people than those that I employ rely on the revenue provided by that industry to stay afloat. So right. people are smarter than me figured out how to continue to make esports relevant and they pivoted entirely to online only events they pivoted mm -hmm. to doing pro-am tournaments with influencers and marketing people um and they figured out how to use their budget to hire us again to make esports mm -hmm. trophy digital events to make promotional materials that would go out to influencers and and you know it took you know 90 days for everybody to figure out how to make it viable again and you know to reimagine an entire industry like that is no no small feat so mm -hmm. afterwards you know things picked up and then by the end of the year they were back to crazy again and here we are um you know a couple months into 2021 and and we're sitting on more business than we had for the entire year of 2018. so yeah. we're we're okay. good thankfully it's you know it's, it's a sigh of relief um, my ulcers that's can calm down for a little while. <laughs> yeah, that's you know that's good. one of that's one of the things we talk about sometimes with the digital fabrication technology is that it, it can give businesses an advantage of being able to be a little bit more nimble and being able to adapt and and pivot to to different types of of uh, approaches or or, or uh, things like that. Have you found that to be the case where the the fact that you're using these digital fabrication tools allows you to sort of shift what or how you're doing it in order to, uh, 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 you know, keep pace with changes in the environment? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one, of, one of the things we've done recently was um, we're, we're pushing uh, printed mold walls for a lot of the pieces that we're doing. For, for instance, I mentioned uh, some companies wanting to partner with influencers for promotional type stuff. And um, we did a piece, and again, if you go to our portfolio section under the uh, video games or replicas, um, it's actually one of the first pieces in the portfolio is the Greyhawk helmets uh, from a game called Godfall. Mm -hmm. um, and I just realized there's some Laura Mipsum copy up there right now. Uh, so I'm yeah, that. I that. <laughs> um, again, like I said, our website's been relaunched. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so these Greyhawk helmets we made, we made 60 of these. Uh, and we, we, we're not going to prototype 60 helmets and sand and finish all of those. We, we, you know, uh, prototyped one set and ended up molding and casting them. And in order to replicate that, we had like, I think five sets of molds, you know, so five sets of molds of the cheek plates, five sets of molds of the visor, five sets of molds of all the little tiny fiddly pieces on the crown. And we, you know, we had to replicate all of those very quickly. And normally, um, traditional mold making, you would be making mold jackets out of epoxy and glass fiber, or sometimes epoxy clay. Um, you know, that's got a, a 16 hour set time before you can use it. You can only do one side at a time because it has to mate up to another side of clay. And then 16 hours it sets, then you do the other side and 16 hours it sets. So, you know, flipping molds that way, you know, we're looking at four weeks before we're, before we're done. Yeah. We only had seven weeks to do the whole thing. 
So um, we designed all of our mold jackets in, uh, in Fusion and then ran them in PLA on our Ultimakers. And so we were able to knock out five sets of molds in about four days because they could just keep going. And as soon as the print's done, mold's done. No problems. Yep. You know, a little bit of cleanup, a little, little bit of sanding and, and uh, pour rubber in it and, and ready to go. And the other thing that was great about that is dimensionally they're identical. You know, you print something on, a, on an open maker, you print the left side of the, you know, uh, the cheek plate mold, and then you print it again. And then it doesn't matter if uh, this one, you know, was print one or print five, they're, they're all gonna made up to the same uh, facing component. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, like having that array that we had, um, we, we wouldn't have been able to do that project without it, just the, the time-wise alone. Um, Gosh, we burned out every single Bowden tube and, and coupler on those machines after that. They did a whole maintenance cycle on all the Ultimakers because they were running basically nonstop for the better part of, I think, like seven or eight days for the mold jackets and then another uh, probably like seven or eight more days on some of the prototypes and we had some packaging we threw in there. So, you know, they were just anytime. Like, it's a lot like a laser cutter. If it fits on there, you run it on there. <laughs> That sounds like a lot of fun. I'd I like to be a fly on the wall in your shop. <laughs> you are you guys are you guys um, working remotely, or are you guys still getting together in person, or or how is it yeah. how is it coming along? Yeah, we're all still in person. Um, fortunately, you know, we have a small staff. There's only uh, oh, I just hired another full time artist, so we'll do we have six six? Hang on. Carol, 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 Joe, me, five five full time artists. Five. It shouldn't be that hard to get to six, Harrison. We have five full-time <laughs> artists um, and then one business manager. Uh, and in a 2,400 square foot workshop with 22 foot ceilings, that affords us a lot of airspace. We all wear masks. Uh, we have a, a decontamination protocol where twice a day, somebody goes to the shop and they, they go over all of the light switches, doorknobs, handles, fridge handle, microwave, all that kind of thing, and disinfect the whole thing. It has ruined the lid of my laser cutter also because mm -hmm. disinfecting mostly isopropyl alcohol and laser cutter lids are mostly acrylic. So um, <laughs> it's very good, but it is cloudy and you can't see anything through it anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, better than getting sick. So uh, we've yeah. been working in person for a while, um, you know, for, for basically the whole thing. For a little while, we were a little concerned about, you know, what it would take uh, if we had to work remote. Um, uh, three of my artists do have home studios uh, wherein they could do some of the work that we do at the shop. Um, I haven't seen the need to do that so far. Uh, we have been doing frequent COVID testing. Nobody's come down with anything, thankfully. Um, and so whatever we're doing, it's working. That's really cool. Have yeah, you um, cool. have you had any struggles? Do you have what are your biggest struggles you've faced over the lifetime of your uh, your business? Personally, or with the business itself? Either. Hmm. Pick one. I'm, personally, work-life balance uh, has mm -hmm. been difficult for me for a very long time. Um, when I first started this, uh, you know, like I said, I'd, I'd go home from my graphic design job and I'd work until one in the morning. And then when I started working as a full-time uh, prep maker in 2011, uh, my wife was in uh, pharmacy school and didn't have a job because she was just into pharmacy school. So I, I take care of all our, all our rent and bills. Um, and so I worked, you know, 12, 13 hours a day, every day mm -hmm. for three years. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the most fun thing in the world sometimes. It was a lot of work, um, it paid off big time. Um, you know, I think my dedication uh, definitely paid dividends. Um, and, and still to this day, you know, I'll, I'll tackle emails at, at night or I'll stay late at the shop even if maybe I don't really have to. Um, I make it a point not to make any of my employees work overtime or weekends. So if there is any extra work to be picked up, I'm typically the one that does it. Um, right. Freelancers are another story. They get paid hourly, they get paid time and a half uh, overtime and then double on weekends. Um, but uh, and they're, since they're not 40 hour a week and you know, I'll be hiring them for like three weeks and then not. Typically I'm like, you want some extra hours? And they're like, hell yeah. So that's that's a little bit different. But my 40 hour week people make sure they hit 40. And I, I don't want them to, to get burned out on the work we do. Um, there's a lot of talk about crunch in the games industry, uh, extra hours, unpaid time. And uh, I don't want my studio to be like that. 
Um, you know, I will say the, the hardest thing, you know, for me um, in running this company has been learning to be a manager. I, I, I did not get into this with the intent to manage people, let alone manage artists. Um, you know, that's a totally different type of person, not just a regular artist. Um, and I know I am one. So, you know, uh, I've had to learn a lot about that and it's, it's tough and I get it wrong. I've gotten it wrong a lot of times in the past. Um, you know, uh, and it, it's been not to get like, you know, super duper, you know, touchy feely here, but it's been a learning experience for me as a person, um, mm -hmm. understanding what it is when you are, you know, asking another person to trade their finite existence for money. <laughs> it's a, it's a funny <laughs> So yeah, the management side's not 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 a natural thing for me, but I'm you know like every other skill I have, I'm trying to make it better. Yeah. Awesome. Still loving it. Day to day, you know, I tell people what I do, um, and I'm like, I make you know, I work in esports, I work in video games, I, I make props and replicas. And first, the, the thing is, I say I own a special effects studio, and they're like, oh, for Hollywood. I'm like, no. Not really. You know, we work with mainly the video games industry and they're like, oh, so you make games? Like, again, no. Uh, you know, and then I, then I do a kind of explain esports or some some of the marketing stuff we do. And they're like, you know, by the end of it, they're like, God, that sounds amazing. And I'm like, you know, it is. I'm super lucky to have what I have. Um, and uh, being able to do this as a full time job, you know, point to my portfolio. And they're like, well, what did you do? You know, what did your company do last year? I was like, well, maybe these 60 helmets for the launch of the PlayStation 5. Like, that's that's effing awesome. Um, but it is still work, you know, uh, it yeah. is still, in, it is still, you know, sanding is not fun. Uh, you know, painting 60 helmets is not fun. <laughs> um, you know, uh, having to, having to put a heat pad on my shoulder for two months after that, cause I blew my shoulder out, uh, you know, just spraying HVLP day after day for, for four weeks straight. Yeah. Not fun. Um, never going to be fun. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it's a job, and and, yeah. and most jobs are like that. And, and I, I will say, the balance of this one, you know, I got a lot more fun than I do drudgery. And, uh, nice. and I mean, coming from somebody who used to design PowerPoint uh, presentations for pharmaceutical companies, this is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's right. and it's your own thing. It's something you've built and will continue to build, and that's that's exciting. Yeah. So but far, that's the hope is it continues to grow. <laughs> For our yeah. audience out there, again, please visit vulpenprops.com. Check out this amazing work for yourself. Take a look at all the, the cool stuff they do. Uh, are there other places people should go if they want to follow your work or check you out on social media, anything like that? Sure. Uh, most of our social media accounts are Vulpen Props. So we got a Facebook, a Twitter, and an Instagram. Um, Facebook, if I'm honest, doesn't get that updated all that much. Our reach is pretty terrible on it. Instagram is where you see most of our stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Twitter, you're going to see some of my work, and then you're going to see some of my rants. Um, and that's just kind of <laughs> what it is. I'm, I'm kind of an open book there. Uh, so that may not be the best place to catch all of our work. Um, occasionally, we'll drop some neat videos on YouTube every now and again because um, some of our clients want build videos. We got some neat stuff up there from some of our bigger projects in the past where we built giant dragons or, or weird mechs. And that sculpture project I was talking about, that's up there too. So I like those mm -hmm. a lot. I'm pretty Excellent. proud of them, and I think that they're pretty well done. Uh, we update our YouTube like three times a year, so don't expect a bunch there. Um, yeah, Instagram is really the best place, and you know, pop by our portfolio and you know, take a look at, at some of the things. And if you like it, I'm glad. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I'm really glad you could join us, uh, Harrison. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having and me, guys. Thanks fun. everyone for watching and uh, please check back uh, to see our other upcoming episodes. As always, you'll find those on our blog at 3duniverse.org. And uh, thanks for, for joining us. See you all next time.